Dr. David Cook on our five-week series. Uh, so we're working week three into our five-week series on preparing uh, to, to play elite tournament golf. And so today we have a special guest with us, uh, Stan Utley. Uh, Stan obviously plays on the PGA Tour and is a renowned teacher himself. And, and him and David have a have a great story to tell between the two of them. And so, uh, Dr. Cook, uh, welcome back. And uh, Stan, uh, welcome to our webinar. Thank you. Thanks for ha thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So last week, uh, Dr. Cook, we talked about uh, accountability accountability to the process during the tournament. Uh, we talked about uh, setting some reminders uh, throughout throughout the tournament, and then uh, we also talked about uh, keeping score on your on your level of focus uh, throughout the round and your mindset. Um, so if we could just briefly talk about those real quick on, on how uh, how we can stay accountable to the process. Uh, what what are some of the uh, kind of reminders uh, that we can do, and then obviously the the scorekeeping of the focus. Well, you know the process uh, the process that we discussed is about. Um, controlling what you have control over. Everything else will tend to take care of itself. If, you know, what we're trying to do is reach our potential. And the idea here is to put your mind in position, to set your mind up over the shot so that your body has a chance to follow and do what it knows it can do. We aren't robots. It doesn't always guarantee success, but it certainly opens us to the possibility more often. And so we talked about putting our mind in position. We briefly talked about see it, feel it, trust it. We didn't go in great detail with that, but just understanding you've got to create a picture feel that picture and then allow it to happen, see it, feel it, trust it. And those, you know, it's a great idea. It's a concept that makes sense. It's how the brain works. Um, and most people agree, that's awesome. I'd like to do that. And then when you get in the tournament, all of a sudden you got all this interference and distractions thrown at you. you got to fight through that and find a way to win the battle against distraction on game day, which is, which is you know, the big game. You've got your physical game. you got the mental game. So... So um, how do you do that? So I talk about having symbols while you play that remind you of what your goal is, and that's to put your mind in position. I, I want people to mark their ball in certain ways. Uh, <coughs> creatively, just put a symbol down that reminds you to do what you do. So every time you look down at the ball, it's like the ball's coaching. You know, I like putting notes on the scorecard. And then finally is accountability to the process. And after each hole, when you write your score down, to keep track of uh, you, maybe you just hit four shots. Did you put your mind in position on all four shots? Keep that running uh, score so at the end of the day you can see literally if you reached your your goal, and that is to put your mind in position on every shot. That's the only way I know to win in the heat of competition. And um, mm -hmm. so we talked about that last week, and our guest is – such a special friend, uh, a great player in his own right, and the foremost putting and chipping and pitching uh, coach in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And we met at a really uh, interesting time in both of our lives when he was attempting to start his career on the PGA Tour, playing the mini tours, and I was just starting my career after learning this information in sports psychology. Well, we're excited to have you. Uh, you know, we met Stan this summer. Uh, him and his son attended one of our camps in Dallas, and and uh, so we're excited that that he, had, he gave us that opportunity to come and and experience what CGC is all about. And so now having uh, Dr. Cook coming to our uh, to our camps to speak, and then having some feedback from from Stan about his experience as a parent at one of our camps, and now his his expertise in the golf world. So. Just really quick, Stan, can you tell us about a little bit about your experience this summer uh, in Dallas at camp? Well, first of all, thanks for uh, having me on the call. Uh, my my son is going into his senior year of high school, and uh, he is a nice golfer, but he's uh, a kid without a great junior resume, just mainly because he hasn't competed much. Uh, he's a very diverse, multi-sport kid, and being – being introduced to your program, uh, college golf camps, and bringing him to the Dallas event was uh, one of the coolest things he and I have ever done. And I, I personally was blown away by the the quality of people and coaches, you know, and the schools represented uh, with your staff. Uh, Jake had a great time. He felt like he learned. It helped him you know, in the process of evaluating does he want to pursue college golf 
and it also opened a lot of doors for him because of his his lack of junior experience now with having participated in your event he is acquainted with the best college coaches and they're acquainted with him because they go out of their way to do that at your camp and uh, although he may not try to play on one of their programs it is their goal that if he wants to play college golf they're going to find him a place to do that yeah well we sure we sure enjoyed having you that's for sure so so maybe, uh, Stan, you can talk about some experiences you had with Dr. Cook uh, early on or throughout your career. On, you know, I think you told me one time that, that he pretty much coached you uh, to a PGA Tour victory. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that and your experience with, uh, with Dr. Cook. I, I'm glad that you left off the word quick on that, on that request. Uh, because <laughs> it, 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 it might not be a short story, but I'll, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, I was definitely on the mini tour. I'd been out of college a short period of time, and I was a, a newlywed. And for the first time having my wife travel with me, uh, she recommended that I do something different other than the, the direction I was going in with my golf career. And uh, sports psychology became a topic. Uh, when I went back to Columbia, Missouri, uh, to, to visit my home over after traveling for the summer, I asked my college golf coach, Richard Poe, I said, do, do we have a sports psychologist at the University of Missouri? And we indeed did. His name is Rick McGuire, and he was the track coach at Missouri. But he was also kind of a very famous sports psychologist in the track and field world as well. And Rick and David were very close friends. So I spent some time, I would say, in the on the side of is your life in order and learning about what, what sports psychology had to offer with, with Rick. But Rick, the first time we met, you know, ex expressed that I must go see his friend David because David really was a golfer and Rick wasn't. Uh, that led to a few months down the road, David was living in Lawrence, Kansas, and I was on my way to the Kansas Open. So we met. We spent time in his home. He spent time watching me prepare for that tournament. Uh, he, he shared that there was also a routine in golf that you needed to be conscious of and master besides the one that was just said, you know, walk in from four steps behind your ball, set your feet square and waggle and hit it which I would call a physical routine, he introduced me to what he shared as a mental routine. And that process of, of learning how to just organize my thought pattern and then be very repetitive and the simplicity of making sure I thought similar, similar things over each shot, uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of as good or better than a movie how it happened to me because at the Kansas Open, which was a course I was familiar with, I had a decent finish that week. Uh, I went on the following week and played my home track, which was the Missouri Open, and shot 17 under in three rounds and was, was the winner there. But uh, by chance, the week after the Missouri Open, I had, I had received an exemption into a PGA Tour event. And, and you have to hear this story well to know that I was not a tour player. I had played my way in a U.S. Open and Monday qualified for maybe three or four or five PGA Tour events, but I was a mini tour player getting a chance to start in a PGA Tour event. And the, the end of that story that week was I did win the tournament. At the end of the following week, which was literally two and a half, three weeks after I met David, I was... I was asking, well, does that mean I get to go to next week's PGA Tour event? Because I didn't even know the rules. Uh, so it was it was an astounding time in my life. Uh, I would have to say, as 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 it pertains to the routine, and and it was it was fresh. It was a bit awkward, I would say, at the Kansas Open. It was still a little awkward to be kind of almost forcing yourself to to think a certain way that you hadn't used before uh, in the Missouri Open, by, but by the PGA Tour event, which was the Chattanooga Classic, this was 1989 to kind of date ourselves, uh, 
it was becoming an easier task, but still very purposeful. And the the one hole I will tell you about was the last hole. I, I, I knew on the 17th tee I was one back. And 17 was a par 5, and, and I was able to birdie that, and that's got its own story that I'll skip for now. But But I had had to finish the third round on the morning of Sunday. So the morning of the last round, we had to we had to come back out and finish round three. So I'm faced with the last hole of the tournament, but I had already played this hole on that day. And so the process of see it was so powerful that I simply drove my three wood down at the corner. I hit a five iron to about 12 or 15 feet and you know the way they told the story i was i was obviously in the zone but but the way they told the story was the person in front of me at 18 he made a birdie putt and he was celebrating and i was so focused that i i basically made the putt to win almost before the crowd settled down because i was in my process of what do i think when it's my turn to hit and uh it's real it happened and and it worked for a career for me. So in that process you he took you through was the see it feel a trusted process? And and yes that's true, but there was a little more to it than that and 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 the part that I think you have to commit to equally as powerful as he talked about the whole process was being uh the part about you observe. You gather your information. It's interesting when I teach these young kids or I go play with the kids, what I observe and I take in as information, you know, I see sometimes that's a skill they need to work on. And then once you take in the information, which means, okay, it really is uphill and the wind's a little bit right to left, uh, you know, I happen to know as a, as a tour player, I, I study the green and I know which way the grain is going on the green. Well, I want to know that that information more about my second shot than I do the putt because I can see it when I get to the green. But it, but but information that I use on my yardage book says I'm hitting into a green that's down down grain. Well, I know my ball's not going to bite versus a green that's heavy into my into me with grain. I might get it to check up. So I take in all my information and then I make a firm decision. And those two powerful things are part of the process. And then, as you walk in through your physical routine, see it, feel it, trust it, allows you to have your mind incredibly focused on the task at hand. And as you guys, David and yourself, referred to earlier, it's it's mostly about eliminating distractions. It's such a powerful tool that it, it allows you to have your mind where it belongs versus letting distractions happen. And, you know, I, I have I have to tell a bit of a story on my two friends. At the Kansas Open, Coach McGuire went with me to introduce me to David. Well, I, I promise I got done with my first round, and I was so angry with these two men that weren't yet my close friends because I was trying to win money in this tournament called the Kansas Open, which was the most important thing in my life at the moment, I thought, you know, besides my young bride. And and they were talking while I was putting in the tournament. And I and I was so mad. And we went out to, to grab a bite after the round, and, and I was like, I can't believe you guys would talk while I was playing. And they said, we can't believe you would hear us because we were talking on purpose to see if you were doing your routine to eliminate distractions. So it was a it, it was a big lesson for me. They were busting my chops right off the bat, getting to figure out whether I could do it or not. Nice, nice. Uh, Dr. Cook, do you have anything to uh, on when you were coaching Stan through these processes and getting his um, getting him to you know, to work towards, you know, the see it, feel it, trust it. Any stories you have with him as far as, um, you know, his, his process, his accountability to the process, uh, maybe maybe uh, some things that he had to overcome uh, just from his previous experience in golf? Well, the first thing is um, 
tee at every shot. No sports psychologist has ever hit a ball before. No no sports psychologist has ever walked inside the ropes on game day with a club in their hand and all that. And so um, all we do is we share information. And what we hope is that people will invest themselves in that information and actually believe it. And Stan did. And so you just need to understand the first thing. So there's a lot of people on the phone that are going to go, oh, it sounds really good. But, you know, they put their foot on the grass and they're – their habits and their tendencies go um, hard in a different direction. Stan invested himself, and I, you know, that's uh, he was investing himself in, in the search for greatness. And that you just got to commend someone for that. I challenge everybody on this phone to do that. Everybody was made for greatness, but not everybody will invest in it. And he did to the point that he went through uh, his friend there, sports psychologist Rick, who my dear friend is, and. Um, and came over to the, you know, to, to meet me and to ask questions and to, uh, and then he embraced the process. So that was, you know, that's the thing I don't always find. I don't find people um, always that are so committed that, you know, just tell me and 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 I'll do it. And uh, the hardest thing I think for for a pro golfer to do is actually change what they do on game day. And and Stan did it. He labeled his ball differently. He wrote on his scorecard. I'd ask him at the end of the day, you know, show me what his concentration percentage was, and he did. I mean, he said it's 93% today, it's 87% today, it's 96% today. And and so, so I guess what I'm trying to say here to all the people listening is not only was he looking for information, but when he found it, he was willing to put himself in a position of accountability. And I, when I look at all of that, that's what I think changed his life because – what Rick told him about life, he he applied. What I shared with him about golf, he worked through that. He applied it, and then you know none of us knew that three weeks later he'd be putting you know for a victory, and um, and he did it, and he went out and had uh, just a uh, incredible run there for a while, and then um, has become an incredible teacher and coach. Again, taking this information and applying it in in the whole concept of what he does. So. I just feel blessed to, number one, have had a student like that, and secondly, to, to have a friend like that. So uh, that, that those are my comments, and it was a beautiful time in both of our lives. It gave me an idea that this stuff was profound, and it gave him a way to um, apply something that that literally opened a door for him that, that he wanted. So it was, it was a blessing to both of us, I believe. And, and I, want, I, want to add, I want to add that uh, – you know, it, it's easy to tell this part of the story because it, it, it led to a win and it changed my life. It, it's incredible the blessings that having one PGA Tour win does for a person. Uh, that said, David and I remained friends and, and, and worked on and off throughout my professional playing career. And uh, one of the most... Uh, special things uh, in my career is when, when you win a tournament of significance, the Ping Manufacturing Company will make a replica gold-plated putter for you. So I, I don't just have one gold-plated putter. I have four because I won three times on what's now our, our called our web.com tour. And I look back on my career and I say, you know, what, what is, is there correlations well, I actually was with David personally inside of two weeks on two of those three wins. Hmm. And so that made me reflect, okay, if I was with David three out of four of my wins in a, in a close proximity of the win, how is that relevant and how did I not do that or what's different when I would go astray and I would struggle and my game wouldn't be the what I wanted it to be. And really as I process, and this is my challenge to David as the coach, because because he's the encourager, like I am the encourager, and, and I can't agree more, David, as, as we teach, does our student really open up and try? I, I gave a lesson in Chicago yesterday, and, and I spent the first hour of this guy paying me nice income to give him a lesson that he told me what he does. And I was like, why am I wasting my time if you're going to tell me about you and you won't open up and try what I have to share with you? 
So mm-hmm. that's that's a challenge a lot. But but what I what I found in the reflection was the fact that I would get so automatic my with my routine when I would go away from having been with David recently that I would let it slip off and I wouldn't practice it. But when I would go back and see David personally, it would get me back in the mode of using my routine when I was preparing. And that's what led to success in the tournament. Uh-huh. So you got to be willing to be vulnerable to the process and changing your processes and even maybe um, maybe even taking a dip down on results in order to reach a higher uh, a higher level uh, ultimately, right? Uh, to reach a higher I, peak. I, I I disagree with that. I think people really? perceive yeah. they're going to dip down. Right. I do not think the dip down has to happen if the person is open minded enough to commit. Uh huh. Uh huh. I think I think perception is you're going to get worse. I do not believe that has to happen. That is so true, Stan, and and um, I'm glad you said that. And Nick, that you know, it's a good question. I'm glad the audience gets to hear that question because when you're working on the mental game, you know, this isn't like uh, I remember um, Nick Faldo is one of the only guys that was ever able to do it, where his teacher was out there one minute before he went on the golf course talking about mechanics, and somehow um, he, he was able to play. But the mental game, all it does is affirm what we know is true, and it confirms what we know is true. When you play your best golf and you get in the zone, your mind is free, your body's freed up because you think thoughts that allow you to see um, what you want to have happen. And so when we ask people to do that, all we're asking them to do is get into a position that they are in when they play and get into the zone. And so I remember uh, Stan's comment actually after the Kansas Open um, when you know when he first started working, of course he had to work harder to remember this and do it. But again, it, 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 this isn't like trying to hit a position at the top of your golf swing. It's just simply saying I'm gonna I'm gonna think thoughts that are gonna allow my body to work. And he said um, he said I played a lot. He said I scored a lot better than I hit it. This is this is uh, it was something like this is this is putting me in a better position to score, but. It wasn't like in the Kansas Open he was uh, automatic with his golf swing, but what was happening is his thinking was allowing him to score and get the job done as his body, you know, as all of us, uh, go up and down in life with our swings and all that kind of stuff. But what it does, it allows you to get the most out of what you have at that moment. And, of course, the obvious thing for all of us is the biggest distraction is when we hit a bad shot to immediately get lost in mechanics and forget about setting ourselves back up for, you know, the next shot. So all this does is say, listen, we know it's a mechanical game, but put your mind in position so you have a chance at a moment in time to get the best you got at that moment. That's all we can ask of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, Stan, you, and, you, Stan, and you, Stan did it. You realize I said it was awkward, but I also said I went fifth win-win when it was new. So when it's fresh in your mind and you're and you're keeping a, a, a different scorecard, so to speak, um, and the accountability by David's presence, uh, well, well, maybe what's uh, what's something that you did in the future, Stan, to try and keep that accountability as if David, you just saw David yesterday. What are some of the things you incorporated into your processes, or maybe your your pre-tournament, uh, you know, going to the driving range routine that that helped you stay accountable to that process? The the one thing that you know, I would say is important that that I would do sometimes and I would not do sometimes would just be to reach out to David. Yeah. You know, and and be in touch. And I think as players, you know, I I I'm in and around tour players my whole career. Some as playing with them, some as coaching them. We are an odd bunch. You know, and part of what makes us really good is we're so independent. But that's also a negative sometimes when it it's. It's about staying in touch with what you're asking us to do. But for me, I would actually say the words, you know, out loud in my mind, see it, feel it, trust it. And Mm -hmm. I would find myself believing that it had become so automatic that I didn't need to do that. And I and I feel like what I would reach back in and get in as far as just the golf shot part of the equation was I would need to say see it, feel it, trust it in my mind to know I had committed to the process, 
That's what uh -huh. and do that when I was practicing. And that's and that's that takes a lot of discipline. It is hard to do. It's kinda of like trying to get my students to actually practice eighteen inch putts. You uh -huh. can say it's boring, but it may be so boring it leads to winning. Interesting. Interesting concept. Well, fellas, we sure appreciate you tonight, and uh, Stan, enjoy uh, the rest of your day, and uh, we'll have we'll be back next week with Dr. Cook uh, to follow up on our on our fourth uh, fourth our fourth part of the fifth uh, five week series. Sorry there, um, but it sure was fun listening to y'all today, and um, you know we just we we just love having you guys and and, and being accountable to that process and a, a different scorecard and the reminders and. And when things go bad, uh, you know, go back to the script. And um, and so we, we sure appreciate it. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for what you're doing. You're doing a great job with these young people. It's it's it's, it's fascinating to watch it unfold. Appreciate you. Awesome. I, thank you. I've enjoyed being with you, and uh, you're you're going to move the needle helping kids get in college golf with college golf camps. And I'm I'm happy to be acquainted with what you're offering, and and hope I can always help. Awesome. Well, thanks, fellas. You guys have a great rest of the day, and we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Take care. Thank you.